Well, hi there, everybody. Warm welcome, everybody, to Light on the Rock. And the Rock is our beloved Yeshua, the Messiah, the Son of God. He is our light, and we shine his light from his rock. Back in 1965, there was a famous Beatles song that actually, I believe, won a Grammy Award for Record of the Year that year. And uh, you'll recognize it instantly when I give you the title. It's called Yesterday. Yesterday. All my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly I'm not half the man I used to be. There's a shadow hanging over me. Oh, yesterday came suddenly. Why she had to go, I don't know. She wouldn't say. I said something wrong and now I long. I long for yesterday. Yesterday. Love was such an easy game to play, right? Love was such an easy game to play, now I need a place to hide away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. And it goes on. Why do we look back? I think one reason that song caught on was because so many people identified with the mood and the thinking and the heart that was behind it. We all know we shouldn't, in God's church at least we know that, and among the called out ones. But rare is the person who never looks back, if there is even one person who never looks back in life. So I want to give a message today on a topic that may surprise you at how much and how often you look back, and the ways you look back that we might not have ever even thought about, and why the head of our family our God Almighty says not to. He commands us not to. He commands us to remember Lot's wife. We know Lot's wife. Look back in the story of Genesis 19. You might want to be turning over there in your own Bible. And we'll look at that today and then look at the many ways we look back besides the way that she may have been looking back. There are many ways. And where should we be looking instead? So I'm hoping you'll get something out of this message. I'd love to hear from some of you and uh, encourage me by letting me know that it was worth looking at the topic. Why do you need it? Are you ready? This is no exaggeration. I believe your very salvation, your eternity could hinge on looking back or not. If not your very salvation and eternity, at least the quality of your new life in Christ will be vastly affected if you live in the past, if you look back. And at least the rewards that you will have for eternity will be largely hinged to this topic. And be warned, your adversary, your enemy, Satan means adversary, wants you and me to look back a lot. And so we'll talk about that a lot too. And I look back way too much. I do. I intend to overcome that and simply stop it now. And you look back. The sermon, in fact, as so many of my sermons do, started as a personal Bible study for me to teach me why it's so bad to be doing what I'm doing, to look back so much, to learn how to counter that urge. And I thought, boy, boy if this is helping me to look at it and see the seriousness of it and to take it seriously and overcome it, maybe others can benefit from it as well. I have been a looker-backer, <laughs> okay? And uh, I have a lot of reason to look back, I guess. But really, ultimately, no, I don't. Because, as you'll find out, that's not where God wants us looking. Now, looking back is not always wrong. A lot depends on your heart and what's causing you to look back. If we make mistake, mistakes, if we sin, or if we uh, have something that we do that... Uh, we want to analyze how we could have gotten it better or how we got into the messes we got into and we can learn lessons. That kind of looking back I don't think is bad. But once you analyze it and repent or change or make notes for next time, now get rid of it and look forward and don't look back. You know the story of Lot's wife. Let's go to Genesis 19, verses 15, starting in verse 15. And this was they were living in the city of Sodom. And apparently they had lived, if you look towards the end of Genesis 19, it says that the cities in which they had lived, uh, so they may have lived in uh, Gomorrah as well, and Admon Geboa, I mean, what are they names? Admon Zeboam, 
and uh, Zoar, which is also before that, called Bela. But anyway, um, uh, they're being warned to get out. Uh, uh, God had revealed to to Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and all the other cities of the plain, and Lot was living in one of them. Interestingly enough, in Genesis 18, God doesn't, uh, or at least Abraham doesn't even bring up Lot as a name, as a topic. He just said, if there be ten righteous, would you spare the city? He never mentions Lot by name, at least not in the account we have. And actually, he was more about saving the city because Lot lived there. And God Almighty said in that face-to-face encounter with Abraham, yes, if there are ten righteous, I'll spare it. In Genesis 19, verse 15, so the angels had been there, and then the uh, the people who wanted to uh, have relations with these angels had been at the door that night. They had been made blind, if you want to read the whole story in Genesis 19. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry. Angel means messenger. Saying, Arise, take your wife, your two daughters who are here. Now, how did you get ten people? Okay, because if you read earlier in the account, you will see that, in fact, there were other daughters and sons-in-law. And so I'm sure that Abraham uh, was thinking there'll be at least ten of that family that will be considered righteous. And so he stopped there. So he had two unmarried daughters. He had at least two or three married daughters and sons and sons-in-law, according to earlier in the chapter. And so uh, that's what Abraham, I think, was counting on. Anyway, so it says here that the two angels had told Lot to get out not, and not to look back. Genesis 19:15, in morning dawn, they said, Hurry, arise, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, and that's part of the message Christ will give us later, when the time comes to get out, there's no lingering that's allowed. The men took hold of his hand, his wife's hands, and the hands of his two daughters, Jehovah being merciful to him, and they brought him out. They probably had to pull him out and set him outside the city. It came to pass when they brought them outside, they said, or he said, uh, the lead angel said, Escape for your life. <clears throat> Do not look behind you or stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. In other words, this whole plain, uh, probably uh, most people think it was on the south end or southeast end of of, uh, Dead Sea. Others question that, but it doesn't matter. That whole area was going to be wiped out. Lot pleads to be allowed to go to the city of Bela, which uh, was renamed Zoar, which means little, and that was granted. Now we pick up in verses 21 upwards. And he, the angel, said to him, said to Lot, Look, I'll favor you concerning this request to go to Zoar, fine, hurry, escape there. I can't do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little. And the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Genesis 14, 8 says the name before that had been Bela. Now, uh, in Genesis 14, it also, in chapter 13, it talks about there being slime pits. Genesis 14, or that's what King James says. It actually is asphalt or tar pits all around it. Kind of like in Los Angeles, you have the La Brea tar pits. It was kind of like that all around all around Sodom and Gomorrah. They had these tar pits. <clears throat> Oil. <laughs> okay. So Lot is actually in the city, another city by this time. He is not, like the Bible story drawings show it, still running out in the open fields and open terrain away from the city. No. They had left the city. They are now in another walled city. Did you know that, by the way? <laughs> it's interesting what uh, we get in our heads, especially when there are illustrations that are not accurate that we see. Then Yehovah, verse 24, rained brimstone and fire, whether that's from a volcanic eruption, whether that was from uh, bits and pieces of um, meteor, uh, meteorite, <clears throat> or comet, or whatever. I don't know what... Uh, what happened here for sure, but something that brimstone and fire, whatever that was, falls down out of the heavens from God. 
So he over, so it's like being bombed, okay? So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the city, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. The New English translation has it, but Lot's wife looked back longingly, because the Hebrew word apparently has that imp implication to it, and was turned into a pillar of salt. They're not adding a word. They're trying to explain what the Hebrew word is. The Hebrew word number 5027, Nabat, or however you pronounce it, for looked means to look intently, to gaze in a focused way. Young's literal Bible translation says she looked expectantly or expectingly behind him. It's the same word used by the angel who said, don't Nabat, don't, don't, uh, don't look intensely back or with any longing in your heart. Don't, don't, don't. <clears throat> she disobeyed, and she was punished. And why was she looking back? The Bible doesn't tell us why, but we can surmise and we can think about it and learn lessons from it. Later in Genesis 19, the next chapter, uh, actually the same verse, the same chapter, but end of the chapter, verses 27 and 28, we see that Abraham also looked towards the plain where Sodom and the cities had been, but it's a different Hebrew word. Just means he observed, he looked down towards, not, not with a focused, longing gaze as Lot's wife had. So neither does scripture tell us why she looked back. Your guesses are as good as mine. <clears throat> I don't know that all of us would have done any better than she did. And I say that because I'm convinced that I look back a lot, trying to overcome it. And you probably do too. And I've watched and heard many believers longing for yesterday. And think about Lot's wife for a second. They had other sons or daughters, we know they did, that were left there. There were at least two or maybe three more daughters and sons-in-law. I believe a son as well. Go back in the, the description in the middle of chapter 19. They may have had some darling grandchildren already back there. They certainly had beloved servants and friends and their children. And Lot was rich. He certainly had livestock, maybe pets, undoubtedly had pets. And they had their home there. And they were wealthy. And they'd been rushed out, pulled out, but had left behind them, no doubt, some priceless jewels, family heirlooms, and maybe just things that would make their escape more palatable, like food, water, emergency kits, money, and so on. Gold and silver. And now she hears these explosions behind her as fire and brimstone rained on the city and her kids and her grandkids and her friends and her animals and her wealth and her livestock. Everything is out there. We're told, not told why she looked back. Some have speculated she wanted to return there to live because she loved Sodom itself, the city, so much. I personally can't see that if you understood that it's all blown up to smithereens now. Why would you go back? It'd be like saying you want to go back to a bombed out city and bombs still raining down on it. A city that had been carpet bombed. Who would want to go back? Unless she had valuable reasons to go back. And therein could be the pointers for us today. I don't personally think she loved Sodom itself so much. as She might have. And the city of Sodom was destroyed not just because of sodomy. But if you read the accounts in Ezekiel and others, they were very greedy, they were unfair, they were unjust, they had violence. Much more than just one sin. I think she was horrified that she could hear what she, uh, uh, on what she could hear going on and very naturally wanted to see if there was something she could do to save her family and friends. I think it had much more to do with that. Much like many people have, uh, have done to race into a burning home to save a child, a pet dog, a cat, or something valuable. That's my take on it, at least. I don't know. It doesn't say why. I suppose we could see someone running into a burning building to save a priceless jewel or a painting. Or, but she had people. She had a child, grandchildren, dear friends. What would you turn back for? Whatever her reasons were, she disobeyed, was punished for it. And obviously this lesson was placed there to be a lesson for us. It's not just a story. Uh, Christ himself, the Son of God, tells us in Luke 17, let's read it. In Luke 17, verses 26 to 34, 
a time is coming when we, like them, will have to get out quickly. That things are now starting to happen, and when they happen, they will be quickly happening. We won't have time to grab the things we normally live with. You won't have time to pick up your or go back for your iPad. You won't have time to go back for your emergency kit that you've so carefully prepared for such a time. You may not have time to grab or go back for, and you shouldn't go back for, anything. Let's read it, Luke 17, verses 26 to 34. Luke 17, verses 26 to 34. 36, I mean. 26 to 34. 26 to 34. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man when he comes, is what he's talking about. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. He's saying life was going on in a normal sense. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise it will be as in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Commerce is still going on. I hope we're getting that. It looked like a very normal thing going on. And unexpectedly, on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. Now, in the account, uh, it describes similar wording to what we're reading here. Um, in Matthew 24, hold your place in Luke 17. In Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, I think in Daniel 8, standing in the holy place, understand it, he says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go back down to get anything out of the house. Anything. Just jump, get out, go. And let him who's in the field Brethren, your life may depend on remembering this sermon and Christ's words. Let him who's in the field, especially if you're in Judea at the time, and you might be. It's a different topic. But let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothing. Then he goes on to say, woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies. And so on, because it's going to be a great tribulation happening right then and there. There's armies surrounding the city. You've got to get out now. Literally, don't waste a minute. I hope I remember this. So back to Luke 17. Luke 17, verse 28. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted and built. Life was going on. But on that day, they're all wiped out. Verse 30, even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who's on the housetop and his goods are in the house, his goods are in the house, his valuables, let him not come down to take them away. I want to point out something else here. This is the context about Lot's wife, goods in the house. So she may have wanted to go back and get her gold and silver and her, who knows, children and whatnot. Those are goods. Those are valuables. And likewise, the one who's in the field, let him not turn back. So in context of what Christ is saying, maybe Lot's wife not only was looking back, but was turning back, starting to go back. It doesn't say that in Genesis, but based on what Christ says, who saw it all happen, neither let him turn back. Remember, that's the context of what he says here. Remember, Lot's wife. And whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life, in other places it says, for my sake, will preserve it. But not here. So verse 33, saving life and all that, follows on the heels of remembering Lot's wife. Don't do anything against this order from your king. Because you think something back there can help you survive better. You'll have to trust your king who says, don't go back. Don't turn back. When it's time to leave, get in your car and go. Don't go back for that extra big bottle of water. 
your emergency kits, go. Just go. Now, in my car, I keep some emergency items. Not a lot because, you know, I have to have space for other things. But I have some things in there. Don't go back to get anything or anyone. Don't go back into your house at that time. That's his command. So between Luke 17 and Matthew 24, Lot's wife looked back with longing. She may have been turning back. There was something back in Sodom, burning up now like a bombed out city, sulfur, asphalt all around. The whole city was, the whole plain was black. Can you imagine asphalt turned, uh, turned, uh, turned to light, it turned, turned to fire? So what can we learn from this, though we don't know for sure why she looked back or t- starting to turn back? Do you look back? Get this. You and I have had the same order that the angel gave Lot's wife. You just heard it. And the order is remember Lot's wife. If we're going to remember Lot's wife, we have to remember the command given to Lot's wife, which was, don't look back. And you and I have looked back and must deeply repent of it. It's not the unpardonable sin. You can be forgiven it. Don't look back. Don't go back. Remember Lot's wife. That's our command from God. Now, what the Son of God continues to say, it's related to going back or looking back with longing. So let's look at some other ways that we, that we, the 21st century, can be looking back. We can be looking back. I'm going to give several points here now. We can be looking back for something Sodom or this world that we have around us offers us, like Sodom could have offered her. In Revelation 18, God says, Come out of Babylon, my people. Come out of her. And that language is very graphic. Quit quit going into her. Quit having sex with her. Quit being intimate with Babylon. Quit being a part of her. You're too close to it. Of, out of this way. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? You're too at one with Babylon. Come out of her, my people. It can't be clearer what God is saying. Let's go back to Genesis 3, verses 4 to 7. Adam and Eve saw something they could gain by eating something they wanted, something the world offered her, by eating of the forbidden fruit of the one forbidden tree. Part of it was when Satan, the adversary, said, you can be like God. He doesn't want you to be like him, knowing good and evil. When you eat this fruit, you're going to be like God. You can be making your own decisions. So let's pick it up. Genesis 3, verses 4 to 7. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like Elohim. You will be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw, verse 6, Genesis 3, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And her husband was with her, and she also gave to him. And he ate. Instead of Adam saying, I don't know who you are, serpent, Get out of here. Yehovah, or Yahweh, where are you? Someone's in the garden. That's what he should have said. Eve, get out. We're not to eat of that tree. You're not to be talking about it. Let's get out of here. He didn't do that. He was not deceived, and she was. And now notice how the Apostle John, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, please maybe even write a cross-reference of this verse to Genesis 3. Uh, Genesis uh, 3, verses um, 6. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17 is your cross-reference. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. This is a very important topic. Do not love the world. Come out of her, my people. Now, we love the people of the world. God so loved the people of the world. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for the world. And so will we. We'll die for the world. But we don't, must not love the system, the cosmos, or the things in the world. Your iPad, your smartphone, your computer, all your tech, technological gadgets that we're so in love with. Your money, your 401k, your car, your air conditioning, your home. Do not love those things. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that's in the world. The lust of the flesh, tie that phrase, the lust of the flesh, to the first thing that Eve saw, that the tree was good for food. She was hungry. Lust of the flesh. The lust for the eye. By the way, this thing of lust of the flesh, I mean, it's a good thing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be fasting much, much, much more in the years to come in the months to come, than I ever have before. We shouldn't be just fasting on the Day of Atonement. We need to be reminding our, of ourselves. I'm not here for food. And I'm overweight, way overweight. And I need to show God that I'm seriously getting the point. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh. And then First John 2, 15 says, or 16, lust of the eyes. A tree desirable to make one, no, here it is, and it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, coveting, saw something attractive. And in Genesis 3 it says, a tree desirable to make one wise. So that then tying that to 1 John 2.16, and the pride of life. So the flesh and coveting and pride is not of the Father, but is of the world. You and I can look back from the point of view of pondering all the things we've given up and where we might be today had we not given up friends and family and others because now we don't keep Christmas and Easter and Sunday and we've alienated family and friends. We're kind of the odd people out. Or maybe we wish we could do the things that our worldly friends do, work and do things on the Sabbath and get more done than we might think. Or we look and they don't, ha and they don't have to tithe like we do. And instead of the joy of tithing, the joy of giving, sometimes we might resent the fact that, boy, that's a lot of money. And first tithe and second tithe that I have forked out over the years. How big my 401k and my savings for retirement would be today if I'd invested all of that instead. Don't go there. Or maybe you're getting tired of being the odd man out at work and at home and so many places and on so many things. Be so careful. That is looking back. My next point. So my first point is looking back for something the world offers. The next point builds on it, wondering if your decisions were worth it. Yeshua said in Luke 14, we have to love him more than family or we aren't worthy. And in Matthew 10, verses 34 to 39, Yeshua says that his ways will cause some friction in our relationships. A man will be against his own father. A woman, a daughter against her own mother-in-law. And then he says in verse 37 that anyone who loves his dad or mom or son or daughter and Luke 14 as and his own life also more than me is not worthy of me. We can't be thinking, we can't allow ourselves to be thinking, was it worth it? Even Peter, the end of Matthew 19 verses 27 to 29 Matthew 19, verses 7 to 29, admits that in following Christ, the Messiah, they had given up all. We have left all, everything, and everyone, and followed you. Yeshua replied that when the Messiah sits on his throne, all who followed him will also be leaders. And then in verse 29 of Matthew 19, 29, and everyone who has left houses brothers, sisters, or father, or mother. Are you getting that? Houses. 
brothers, sisters, father, mother, add in-laws in there, wife, children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. We're going to have to leave sometime in our life. When it comes time to flee to a place of safety, which I still believe has a merit, might not be the, the scenarios we picked before, but we'll all have to leave. We either die or we, you know, we leave things that way. Do you know how much uh, the richest people who died, you know, you know how much of their billions and billions that they left when they died? All of it. <laughs> so eventually we all have to leave all of it. So everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, for my name's sake, will inherit a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. We can't go looking back. I have in my past. I've, you know, when I graduated from high school as valedictorian, I was 18 years old. I had a fully paid four-year degree at a college or university of my choice being offered to me. And I went to a small private college in England instead. I can't be looking back. Then after college, I was offered a terrific paying job with management in California and turned that down too to do what I felt was my king's calling for a lot less pay. And anyway, I shouldn't look back. Let's not be wondering if only I had done such and such instead or married so and so instead or t taken this job or that job instead. I wonder if it was worth it. In Hebrews 10, verses 32 to 39 I want to read this on your own. Paul reminds them, whoever's writing the book of Hebrews, reminds them of all they've gone through, the tribulations, the reproaches, and how you had compassion on me and my chains. So the one writing it had been in chains. That's why I think it really was Paul. And joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. So they gave up all, knowing you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, don't cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. You have to endure a lot because it goes on in verse 38. It says, it says, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We're not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. I want you to catch the phrase, those who believe. Catch the phrase in verse 38, the just shall live by faith. You have to believe, and you have to live by faith as your things are being taken away from you. And only if, what, what if I hadn't gone this way? You have to believe. A big reason not to look back. We'll get into that at the end here. So, point number one, is there something in this world that this world has to offer that we long for? Point number two, wondering if your decisions were worth it. Don't be looking back. Number three, going back to get something when you know you should just trust your Savior and obey what he said. Let him who's on the house stop not come down. Let to go back in the house to get something. Let him in the field not come back to get his jacket. Christ equated going back to the house to get your jacket or whatever was in the house or even trying to talk loved ones into leaving like Lot did. Go back to Genesis 19, but his sons-in-law thought he was only joking. So he's probably a wisecracker. He probably was kidding a lot. I kid a lot. So when the time came to be serious, I have angels in my house from God. They're saying this place is going to blow up soon. we got to leave now, all of us. Oh, Dad, come on. You're pulling my leg again. I'm not falling for it this time, or uncle, or whatever it was, or father-in-law. Are you going to obey our command? Don't look back. Don't go back. So it means you're trusting your own instincts better than what your Savior said. Don't go back. But you need that water. You need the emergency kit. You need the fire starters. You need the food. You need the cell phone. Don't go back. 
the time comes for you to flee. Now, I know it says in Judea, but there may be times in this own country, where whatever this own country is to you, when you know the gangs are coming down the street. Don't be packing at that point. Get out. Get out. Trust God. Get out. Point number four, a big one, another way that we look back, a big one for me, we look back by not letting go of our past mistakes, our sins, our bad decisions. In other words, we're living in yesterday. We're living with a life of regrets. We're not forgiving ourselves of past sins. I think largely because some evil people who call themselves ministers or brothers or sisters of yours won't let you forget. That's evil. That's a current sin. And yours might be 30 or 40 years ago. Or 10 or 20 years ago. Or a year ago. Whatever it was ago. Don't, we must not be looking back. That's why I like some, not all, time travel movies, I guess, because it allows me to daydream a little bit what might it have been if I could have gone back in life, knowing what I know now, and do it over? Would I do it over if I had my current knowledge in my heart and God's Spirit with me now and go back 20, 30, 40 years ago? And yet, you know, even now as I prepare the sermon, these time travel movies have less allure to me because of the very lessons of this sermon. Regret. Regret. Why she had to go, I don't know. She wouldn't say, I said something wrong, and now I long for yesterday. So now I need a place to hide away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Oh, no, you don't, brother and sister in the Messiah. No, you don't. No, you mustn't. So regret, if you don't move on, is a form of looking back. And if you're killing your present opportunities right now, you have to burn your bridges. You have to burn the ships. You remember uh, the story of Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar, when he invaded England in uh, it was BC, I don't know, 30, 50 BC or something like that. I don't know when exactly it was. It was before Christ. And uh, well, came as a man. Anyway, his soldiers saw their ships off the coast burning. Julius Caesar had ordered all the ships burnt, so there was no way out. They could not escape. They had to conquer or be killed. We have to burn our bridges and our ties to the past. And it's also like saying, Master God, I don't trust that anything's going to work out quite for good after all. You're, you're good, fine, but I messed up so bad. I've ruined my life so badly and a bunch of other lives so badly, which I've done. And you've done. I'm so sorry, but I also accept that my life is ruined, Father, so never mind. I, I, I regret it. My, my life's ruined. That's wrong, a wrong way to think. <clears throat> but that's how a lot of us do react. I certainly have. I hope no more. Satan loves it when I react like that with such deep regrets. I just want to quit, maybe even end my life or something. Stop it. That's what our Father wants for us. No, 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 he doesn't want that for us. He wants us to move on. Satan capitalizes on this, capitalizes, and he trash talk. Oh, how dare you call yourself a child of God after all you've done? You should resign right now from the family of God. And why do you have a website preaching to others when you've done so badly? Right now, resign, give up. That's what Satan says. Don't listen to that. So regret takes shape like, I sure wish I'd done this or that instead. Or why didn't I? The could have, should have, and would have, you know, all the coulda, would have's in our life huh? type of questions. Why didn't I pursue someone else to marry? Or did, why, did I, why didn't I attend a different college? I could have. 
I should have. No, 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 brethren. Why didn't I keep a better eye on my kids and what they were doing and now one of my kids is dead? Or why wasn't I a better husband or a better wife? You know, more than half the marriages end in divorce. Why didn't I read more to my children and build a closer relationship with them instead of all the overtime work I did while I should have been home reading books to them? Why didn't I encourage them more? Why didn't I spend more time playing baseball with them or fishing? Why didn't I pray more? I could have, should have. I wish I could go back and spend more time with my mom and dad, you might think, especially now that they're both gone. Why didn't I take full advantages of my choices, my 401k, matching funds? Why, did I have to, why didn't I pull out of the stock market? Or why did I? Why didn't I pull out when I could have? Regrets, regrets, regrets will kill you. Philippians 3, verses 12 to 14. Here's what God tells us through Paul. He says, I haven't attained what I want to be yet. I'm not already perfected, but I press on. Philippians 3, verse 12. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. I want to grab him and hang on to him. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended. One thing I do, I preach to myself. I need this sermon as bad as anybody out there. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Oh, that would be so much easier if you brethren would let me forget. And if we brethren would let others forget and show them the heart of God. By fellowshipping and accepting their fellowship instead of turning the people turning around going the other way when we see them coming because they are so evil because they did this thing 30 years ago 30, 40 years ago or 5 years ago whatever your ca your case or someone else's case is Paul says forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead I press to the mark the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting your sinful past. It's so hard to do sometimes, especially when people keep throwing it back in your face. Don't you be doing that. That is so evil to dig up forbidden, forgiven sins that have been buried in the blood of the Son of God. And you go digging into the Son of God's blood Find something all bloodied up, covered by the blood. And then put it on the internet, put it out there for everybody else, put it on your emails and texts. It's the worst kind of grave digging, and it's a current sin you're doing if you do that. And it sure makes harder for people to forgive themselves when they see God's so-called children won't let them move on. Truth is, I can't unring a bell I've rung, and neither can you. We can quit ringing it, and that's repentance, changing directions, changing our lives, with Christ now living in us more fully. You know, God has given me, has given you, such a huge gift. It's the opportunity to live now in the present and hoping for the future and not belonging for yesterday, not the past. What the gift is that he's given us is the right now. And that's why we call his gift of living right now the present. It's God's present to us. It's his gift, the present, the present moment. When we live in the past, we're ruining this great gift, the new present from God. The ability and the right to live today, not wasting today with yesterday. The Beatles song, Yesterday, full of regrets. I don't sing that song anymore. As you could tell. <laughs> not sure how the tune even goes, it seems. The epistle or letter to the Philippians was one of Paul's last book he wrote. In that quote we just read about being very strong and looking ahead. But earlier in Paul's life, 
in First Timothy, he did reminisce a bit about some of the horrors that he had done. He had done such terrible things, and God called such a terrible sinner to write most of the new covenant for us. That Paul even calls himself in 1 Timothy 1.15, he said, Christ who came to, into the world to save all sinners, of whom I am chief. I'm chief sinner. I'm the worst. Because you know what I did, he says? I hurt people. I killed people. And by the way, yes, when you commit adultery, you hurt people. And you kill them. Some people will actually commit suicide when they feel so rejected because their spouse committed adultery with you. It's hard to forgive yourself and not look back. He persecuted believers with such venom and zeal, he literally dragged them off to jail in chains, threatening and torturing various ones until they blasphemed the very name of Yeshua. Until they blasphemed. In Acts 8, verse 3, we know he was the one authorizing the stoning of Stephen. That's what it meant to hold the clothes of those who were doing the stoning. So really, in a sense, he killed Stephen. He was the one authorizing it. He was a top rabbi, remember, being groomed to be in the steps, replace Rabbi Gamaliel. We call him Gamaliel. I think the Hebrews call him Gamaliel. A well-known rabbi to this day, one of the top ten rabbis ever. And when Christ himself appears to Saul in Acts 8, Yeshua asked, Why are you persecuting me? But in Acts 8, verse 3, after the death of the murder of Stephen, Acts 8, verse 3, As for Saul, that was his name before he called himself by the Greek name Paul, Paul was not against using Greek, okay? <laughs> so please, you, you guys who are so into Hebrew that you uh, despise the Greek language and the Greek people and the Greek way of thinking, stop it. Stop it. Paul changed his name to a Greek name, Paul, which means little. He made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, dragging them in the streets, probably literally. Then in Acts 22, when he was talking about it to the Hebrew crowd, Acts 22 in verse 3, verse 4, verse 3 says, I was zealous towards God in verse 4. Acts 22, verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death. Binding and delivering into prisons, both men and women. And then he went all the way to Damascus, he says at the end of verse 5, to bring them back in chains to be punished, to be punished, to be killed, frankly. And then to King Agrippa in Acts 26, verses 9 to 11. Read it yourself, but I'll read part of it here. I myself thought I must do things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints, many, I, chief sinner I, shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, they were put to death. It wasn't just Stephen. I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme. Acts 26.11, in Paul's own words, why he called himself chief sinner. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them to the foreign cities. Then he says, on the way to Damascus, in verse 12, 13, and 14, this brighter than sun light started shining, he got knocked off his horse, and when I'd fallen to the ground, verse 14, Acts 26, 14, I heard a voice speaking to me in Hebrew. Saul, Saul, 
Why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I've been goading you, Paul, to get away from where you are, to come this way, and you keep persecuting me. He says, Who are you, Lord? And remember, he's speaking in Hebrew. I am Yeshua. The sound of the name Jesus hadn't been even pronounced yet for centuries still. He said in Hebrew, I am Yeshua. In Greek, it's Jesus. But he was speaking Hebrew, so he said Yeshua. So I think sometimes we do look back. We shouldn't. But when you do things as horrifically as Paul had done, and as you and I have done, it's hard to not have some regrets of the massive pain you've caused yourself and others. And others have caused me. And like Paul, sometimes it's hard to move on. But move on we must, as Paul did. So he could say later on in, in his, I think Philippians, wasn't it, where it says, there awaits me a crown of righteousness? Or was that Second Timothy? I can't remember right off, but God puts our sins away and remembers them no more. Hebrews 8, 12. If God's willing to forget our sin, why aren't we? Why aren't we? So there awaits me a crown of righteousness, Paul said. I believe that is Second Timothy. I think it's chapter 4, but I'm not sure. But I think it's Second Timothy 4, 8. Other, but, you know, God wants us to remember them no more. They're gone. The world will say there's a special place in hell for then they name what they consider to be the worst of sins. That's just plain wrong. If the worst of sinners, which is what Paul said he had been, he tortured them, remember, until they would blaspheme, and then he killed them. So the notion that there's a place in hell for you is just plain wrong. All sinners, including the worst of sinners, which Paul said he had been, if they can repent, there's a future they don't have to long for yesterday. They don't have to hide in yesterday. So if God himself forgets our sins when he covers them and buries them in the blood of his own son, why are we wasting that sacrifice? Why are we wasting his sacrifice of his own son? So we can hang on to these past sins that should be washed away in the blood. So I've got to practice it too. All of us have had a part in helping one another move on. All of us can have. How? By letting someone's past sins be past. By representing the love of God and the love you show others. By not listening to the gossip. When you listen to it, even if you don't spread it, if you let someone tell you, you're working for the accuser of the brethren. You're being his assistant. By accusing, gossiping, and letting gossip be told to you of past sins, that are now gone, buried, and washed in the blood, as were yours. And there's none righteous, no, not one, Scripture says. If you've not been perfectly righteous, what right do you have to spread manure or listen to any manure, I'm using the nice word for it, about anyone else? Don't revel in someone else's manure. And if others are reveling in your manure that's now buried, that's their deal with God. Some have had a very hard time moving on because some evil people, including ministers, just won't let them move on. God have mercy. A side lesson, if you wish you could have gone back in time and wish now that, and, and think you would do things differently, as you have opportunity, do them differently now. If you wish you had spent more time with your kids when they were growing up, do it now with your grandkids. That's what I'm doing. If you wish you'd gotten more sleep, went to bed with your wife instead of working till one or two like I often have do it now you're already divorced too late well learn from it move on I wish I'd encouraged more people I do my best to I want to do it more I want to be a modern day Barnabas which means son of encouragement I wish I'd learned how to 
whatever it is, piano, ukulele. One of my cousins is starting to learn ukulele. I think it's fantastic. You want to oil paint? You want to learn wood carving, wood crafts, needlepoint, how to cook? I want to do all of the above. Except maybe needle, except maybe needlepoint, I don't know. Start doing those things now. Okay, another way we look back that's so dangerous. We look back so dangerous instead of regretting. Sometimes we, when we're lying down to go to sleep at night or waking up in the morning, we start reliving the past pleasures that we experienced. The pleasures of sin for a moment in the book of Hebrews. In daydreams, in lustful memories, especially sexual type sins. So dangerous, so very bad. Years later, there could be nothing, there should be nothing pleasant about sins we committed in the past. Are you replaying, reliving old memories ever? We should never be playing them back in any way but disgust and not, not replay them at all. And if we're replaying and reliving old memories, they'll never get out of our head. You're just cementing them in your brain. Stop the thinking and reliving of the past. And if you're doing that in anything short of disgust at yourself, have you really left those sins behind? Paul admitted to still at times succumbing to the lure of sin when he says, that which I hate, I do. He said a couple times in Revelation, I mean Romans 7, Romans 7. But notice the key word. He said he hated that which I hate. I still sometimes do those, those things. So if we reminisce over past sins and replay them in our lives with any sense of enjoyment, if we're reliving them, can we say we hate those past sins? If you hate past sins, you won't be reliving them. If we hate past sins, we won't feel good or enjoy any time we give to them. Now, we all commit some of the same things repeatedly, like coveting, like losing our temper or breaking our patience or breaking the Sabbath in some way. So the old notion that if you really have repented, you won't ever do it again is nonsense. And that's why Christ said, even if your brother comes to you seven times seven, 70 times seven or seven times in a day and says, I, I repent, you are to forgive him because that's how we have to come daily and ask God daily to forgive us our sins and trespasses daily. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins daily as we forgive our debtors, those who have sinned against us. I know sometimes I give in to the pleasures of sin for a moment, but within seconds or minutes I hated myself for it, repented de deeply. Within minutes I'm thinking, why did I do that? It felt good during the time, but not so good two minutes later. As guilt comes in. Paul sinned, but he hated the sins he gave into. Overcoming sin will be a lifelong goal. And of course, right now, Christ has overcome. And it's his perfect life that covers us now when we accept him. Some look back by enjoying movies and shows that depict their old lifestyle. And so they vicariously live within that movie. I don't understand how I can. In fact, my wife and I were watching a movie. It gets into adultery and thing like that even if they don't show any nudity or whatever. Uh, I look at her and uh, I don't want to enjoy watching adultery because I know it is so painful. So again, rephrasing. So, so we turn it off, change the channel most of the time. I want to get to saying to where I can say all the time. Rephrasing what Paul said, I now hate the things I did, the sins I committed. I really hate it when I still from time to time do the things I hate. Children of God will not find pleasure in watching sinners sin. Children of God will not find pleasure in watching infidelity going on. Children of God will not find pleasure in watching a woman unclothed or man unclothed and lusting. Children of God will not find pleasure in bodies being blown up and being stabbed and blood splurting everywhere. Children of God, 
And if you are enjoying those things, repent of it deeply and understand what I'm saying. That which I hate. Yes, we sometimes still do. But make sure you hate the sin. And worst of all, reliving old sins may say you haven't come even yet to really hate sin. I preach to myself. Let's be sure we're not looking back in any way. We're not looking back with any longing. We're not looking back with regret anymore. And certainly not with any relish. Ultimately, and here's the really big point why looking back is so bad. It shows you lack faith in your king and your savior and where he's taking you. This is really the point. He can use even your worst sins and take you someplace with that. Think of David and Bathsheba. As awful as that was. As awful as that was. It was that union, David and Bathsheba, not the one of adultery, but after he killed her husband and then married her, the next child, Solomon, became the messianic line. Something good came out of something even that horrible. And we still read his Psalms. We don't say he's disqualified himself now. We have to throw out the book of Psalms. We still know he's going to be the king of Israel under Christ, who will be the king of the universe. Luke 9, verses 61 to 62. Another said, Lord, Luke 9, 61 and 62. Master, I'll follow you. But let me first go and bid farewell to those who are at my house. Jesus said to him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. I'm going to do a sermon sometime on all the quote-unquote tough words, tough language that Jesus used. This is one of them. You know what? Go ahead, say goodbye, but you're not going to be fit for the kingdom. I talked to a friend of mine recently, and I just said, do you have regrets? He paused just a second. He says, no, Philip, I, I, I don't. Since I've turned my life over to Christ, any wrongs I did, he erased and paid for. And now I just trust that whatever he does, wherever he leads me, I should follow him. And I have no regrets because he'll, he'll use even all that bad stuff somehow, some way for good. he work all things out for good to those who love him and are, are the called according to his purpose. When Elisha was called to be the follower, the replacement for Elijah, and to take Elijah's mantle, be the new prophet. The story is in 1 Kings 19, verses 19 to 21. At first, Elisha asked, if, just like the other guy did, can I go say goodbye to mom and dad? And in the end, though, what did Elisha do? He burned his bridges. He burned his way back to the profession of farming that he'd had at the time. And he burned his plows. He burned his equipment. Sacrificed the oxen. Total commitment. Totally burned the bridges and ties back to the past. Wow. When you had the old-fashioned plow, you had to do your best to plow a straight furrow. The only way to do that is to have a marker up ahead and not take your eyes off that marker. Because when you do, and, and the, the ox is pulling your plow forward, and when you do, and now you're looking back, your line will go off. It won't be on target. It won't be straight. You're going to end up missing the mark, which interestingly enough is one of the meanings of sin in Hebrew. Missing the mark. Keeping your eye on the goal on Yeshua keeps, it, keeps you going straight. That's what Philippians 3, we just read it, said that my, one thing I do, I forget the things behind me. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. Hebrews 12, verse 2. I look to Jesus ahead of us. I'm looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, the thing set in front of him, see, for the joy that was set before him, even Yeshua, as he was being nailed through his wrist, the hand, the palm, the hand, uh, you know, uh, include, included back then all the way to the mid-arm, and they would always actually hang people by a nail through the wrist. It was also considered part of the hand. 
you do, do it through the, the palm and it, it would rip through. So they would do it through the wrist. Very, very, very painful and dangerous. And then as they jolted him up upright and put him up there, the only way he got through all that was by looking ahead to the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame. He was up there naked, beaten, dying the death of a criminal because of you and me. My point is he looked ahead. He didn't look behind him. He looked ahead. And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He looked ahead. So another huge point. We can't maximize again. I said it earlier. I want to say it again. This wonderful gift the Father has given us. Right here and now. Living right here and now. Under his direction. It's the present moment. That's why we call it the present. It's God's gift. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 14. Look at this message in Jeremiah. I just love this passage. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 14. God speaking. God's telling Jeremiah, tell the people this. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says Jehovah, the thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. And then you'll call upon me, go and pray to me, and I will listen. You'll seek me and find me if you search me and when you search for me. With all your heart, I will be found by you, says Jehovah. I want to give you a future. I don't want you living in yesterday. Oh, I believe in yesterday. No, you don't, my brother and my sister. And looking back can be forgiven. I'll put in some notes here about Mark. I have, I'm running out of time. But Mark had not only looked back, but he'd gone back on a journey with Paul and Barnabas. And Paul had wanted nothing more to do with about him. And so he wanted. He, he took Silas and Barnabas took Mark, John Mark. And because of Barnabas is giving him a second chance and forgiving him, Mark comes, Mark ends up very well. He ends up being a, a servant to Peter. And also in Paul's last days, he, he says in, in, I think it's in Second Timothy, he says, bring me, bring me John Mark, because bring me Mark, because he's helpful to me in the ministry. I'll put that in the notes. The scripture says that. So even Paul and Mark made up. <clears throat> and Mark was forgiven and goes on to write the gospel the good news, according to Mark. Basically telling us the story as he heard it from Peter. Now, how about you struggling with life? Take someone else you know struggling with life. Take him under, or her under your wing. Accept one another. Show them, come on, I'm looking the way you are today, not the way you have been in the past. I promise you, when people of God who've lost hearts see God's children, letting God be the judge and accepting them back, like Paul says to do in Second Corinthians 2, to the horrible sinner with the horrible sex sins, he says, bring him back. He's not doing that anymore. Lest he be overcome with over much sorrow, with too much sorrow. We're not unmindful of Satan's tactics. And we must start applying to one another, Second Corinthians 5, where we are now new creations. In Christ. He says, I know those of you who knew Christ in the flesh realize he's not like that now. He's in majesty. We, that, we, no, that first, that's Second Corinthians 5, 16. He so says, from now on we, we, we regard no one according to the flesh. We are not in the flesh but in the spirit if we have Christ's spirit within us. Romans 8 says. So therefore... Regard each other as new creation. That's what he's begging them to do. As new creations. And he says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Don't turn your back on people, no matter how bad their sin was. Killing people, come on. Torturing them, making them blaspheme, dragging children and women, well, women and children, I mean, women and men at least. Uh, dragging them in chains to prison and then killing them, making them uh, be tortured so much they blaspheme. 
God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, he says in verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5.18 That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, so neither should you and I. Nor should we do it to ourselves, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Accept people back into your friendship and fellowship as you see the fruit of a new life now, no matter what they've done. If it's been forgiven and repented of and their life is changing. They're doing works of good, good deeds. Let them move forward. And you move forward, whether people let you or not. I preach to myself. Let's draw this to a close now. We must not look back at our decisions to be a child of God. We must not look back at our old sins, whether with regret or, God forbid, reliving them. That would be like a pig going back to the wallow or a dog going back to his vomit, as Peter says in 2 Peter 2. You can't plow a straight furrow if you, if you don't keep your eyes on Yeshua, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. we got to help others forgive their past by showing them we do forgive them and praise God living in them now more and more. Encourage them. Just be normal around them and with them. Let people know you're so glad to see to see them again and when they do come back. And living in the past with regret will kill you. It truly can lead even to suicide. God is so powerful that he can turn even your worst things in your life into something good like David and Bathsheba, like the story of Samson, like the story of Jacob, uh, <clears throat> lying to his father, uh, you know, about the, the birthright promise and, and how that all ended up. The story of Joseph being sold into slavery, how all that ended up. i got to give a sermon on that soon again. But most of all, looking back means you don't trust God is working in your life. Looking ahead and forgetting the past shows God you do trust what he's doing in your life now, though we often don't even understand it even now. We have to trust him, trust him, trust him, trust him. Even if we're in an accident, even if we're going through a hurricane, even if we are going to die, trust him, trust him. So hard when it gets real tough. So hard. Hard for me too. I'm flesh and blood too. I'm trying to live in the Spirit. So are you looking back? Or are you looking ahead to what will come next? You've turned your life over to Yeshua's control. Let Him! Your old self supposedly died and now your new life is in Christ. So let Him lead you. Follow. Follow Him. Those who are in Christ, who have God's Spirit, one of the signs of that is that they follow the lead of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8.14. So let's be like the men and women of faith in Hebrews 11, who for what they looked ahead and they looked up to a city whose builder and maker is God. It says they could have looked back, but they didn't. Read that in the middle of Hebrews 11. They didn't. They didn't long for yesterday. They didn't live in yesterday. They lived in that wonderful gift from God, the present moment, as they, even while they obeyed and lived and walked with God in the present, in His gift. They also looked ahead to that marker of the kingdom of God in our Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Don't look back. Remember Lot's wife. Don't enjoy the song yesterday. Because that's not your story. Your story is today and tomorrow, not yesterday. Thank you, Father in heaven, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your incredible love. And Yeshua, the pain you went through for me, I don't want to waste that by... Not letting you, not letting you give me a new start. I don't want to waste it. I certainly don't want to waste it by digging in your blood looking for other people's sins that you've forgiven. Forgive those who haven't learned this yet, Father, who do dig in your blood, in the blood of your Son. Forgive them. Forgive them. Be kind to them. Bless them. 
Watch out for them. Bless them. And help us to look forward and live the now and the future, but not the yesterdays. We love you, dear God. We love you, dear Jesus, dear Yeshua. In your mighty and holy name. Amen.